great honour for me to participate in this celebration of Gallery Press on its 50th birthday by reading some poems of John Montague, one of Gallery's authors, of course. John was a great friend of mine, a great friend of University College Corks, where I work, and indeed where John worked and taught me as a student, as an undergraduate, and indeed where in the library we have a lot of his writings, a lot of his papers, and where we also still have very happy memories of John, both as a teacher indeed and as a colleague and visitor in later years. John was a, a, a magnetic person, um, an enigmatic person. Um, he mixed with a huge number of people, had a very interesting life, well documented in his autobiographical work. And he inspired great loyalty in friendship. Um, one of the friends he had was the painter Morris Graves. And the first poem that I'd like to read of three of John's in this celebration is called Woodtown Manor. Morris Graves, a great painter, also an inveterate garden maker and house restorer, um, living in West Cork for a period, but also living in Woodtown Manor in Dublin. And this is, poem, is a poem called Woodtown Manor for Morris Graves. I'm reading from the Selected Poems of John, uh, published recently, uh, 2000, uh, 1961 to 2017. Woodtown Manor for Morris Graves. One. Here, the delicate dance of silence, the quick step of the robin, the sudden skittering rush of the wren. Minute essences move in and out of creation until the skin of soundlessness forms again. Part order, part wilderness, water creates its cadenced illusion of glaucous, fluent growth. Fins raised as in a waking dream, bright fish probe their painted stream. Imaginary animals harbour here, the young fox coiled in its covert, bright-eyed and mean the baby bird, the heron like a radiant italic illuminating the gospel of the absurd. And all the menagerie of the living marvellous, stone shape of toad, flicker of insect life, shift of wind-touched grass, as though a beneficent spirit stirred. 2. Twin deities hover in Irish air, reconciling poles of east and west, the detached and sensual Indian god, Franciscan dream of gentleness. Gravity of Georgian manner approves with classic stare their dual disciplines of tenderness. The next poem of John's I'd like to read is from Second Childhood. Second Childhood um, is a beautiful collection and was published shortly after John's untimely death in December 2016. The poem I want to read is called Star Song. It's a short poem that comes at the start of the collection. John's poetry evokes uh, the, the wonder of childhood wonderfully um, and he in his later years as this title attests um, went back up more and more often to his childhood sometimes to that troubled place uh, sometimes to that happy um, luminous place star song the stars still sing even if clamorous mortals we cannot hear them chorusing their silver music silent nocturnes. A new astronomy is needed to marry the scientific and mythical, the musical and magical, the gleaming mathematical. As a child, I lay trying to hear them, like the astronomer princes of the old world, keeping a vigil, attending a miracle. The next poem I'd like to read is based in West Cork. Um, John and his family had a house in the Letter Valley, um, very near Ballydy Hub, the village of Ballydy Hub in West Cork on the Mizzen Peninsula. Um, I knew this house before I knew it was John's, um, being familiar with the area. And indeed, um, John often mentioned to me that he bought that land and built the house um, with the help of a man called John Fitzgerald. This is called Letter Valley, and it's 
about one of the neighbouring families in that particular townland. Mary Kate's kitchen. The gate scringes upon its hollowed stone. I feel I have stumbled back into my own. Old men brooding before a metal hearth. Women bustling between pantry and oilcloth. A moon-faced wall clock and display of delf. The girlish gravitas of the virgin on her shelf. A long way round to curve near home again. Kindling embers of a long, smoored self. And finally, I'd like to read a poem by Peter Fallon. Peter, of course, the editor of Gallery Press, and the person whose vision and judgment and determination has made sure that the press continues to be a beacon of and for Irish poetry, uh, nationally and internationally. Peter's own poetry, and indeed his wonderful translations, are very much in touch with, with the land and with the people and the work of the land. And this particular poem that I'd like to read comes from Peter's book, Strong, My Love, and it's called An Outlook. An Outlook. They have ruffled the embers of evening and flap from its flames. They come like clockwork, minutes later, every eventide, a loud returning that proclaims the row of limes in which they pause en route to roosting in the rookery, a place of rest. They sketch black scripture in the sky. They watch from trees where they don't nest, these pairs and trees, tens and dozens, making thousands, while I, intent on praise and mesmerised, wonder what, as they fly by, they might be, and realise they are the days. Um, there's a theme with the poems by my brother Kieran that I'd like to, to read. Snow is the theme, in a way. Um, he loved um, Frost and Elliot Snow figures in their work a lot. I've been reading the novel Ice by Anna Kavan, and snow appears there as something that is icy, strange, ethereal, beautiful, gives a beauty to the apocalypse and to the darkness. Um, Belfast was the source of many of Kieran's poems. This poem, the first one, goes back to childhood and back to the Belfast that we knew and the kind of schools that we went to, Slate Street School. Back again, day one. Fingers blue with cold. I joined the lengthening queue. Roll call. Then inside. Chalk dust and iced milk. The smell of watered ink. Roods. Perches. Acres. Ounces. Pounds. Tongues weighed imponderably in the darkening air. We had chanted the twelve times table for the twelfth or thirteenth time. When it began to snow. Chalky numerals shimmered down. We crowded to the window. These are the countless souls of purgatory, whose numbers constantly diminish and increase. Each flake as it brushes to the ground is yet another soul released. And I am the avenging archangel. Stooping over mills and factories and barracks, I will bury the dark city of Belfast forever under snow, inches, feet, yards, chains, miles. The next poem deals with a number of elements that pertain to the Carson family and to being Irish and to poetry and to music. Um, our father used to tell us a lot of stories. Kieran wrote a lot about my father, um, certainly in the Star Factory. Um, our father brought us up with stories of 1798. He used to bring us up to the cave hole um, where Kieran lived near the cave hole um, on the Antrim Road. Um, so we would hear stories about uh, Henry Joy McCracken um, in the woods, um, up on the Napoleon's nose with his telescope looking out to Belfast Loch, maybe hearing the blackbird out there and the British warships coming into port and 
our father would sing us um, Honey Johnny Kraken, the song, which would have us in tears. Um, my God, I turned my head and cried that murdered Henry Joy was the last line. Um, we were brought up speaking Irish as well, and there's a substrate of Irish in a lot of Kieran's work. Um, this poem is also based on the Irish traditional ur, um, so, there's, so it has the Irish in it, it has music in it, it has history in it, and it has snow. 1798. I met her in the garden where the poppies grow, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine. And her cheeks were like roses, or blood dropped on snow. Her pallid lips were red with papal Spanish wine. Lulled in these wild flowers with dance and delight, I took my opportunity and grasped her hand. She then disclosed the eyelids of her second sight, and prophesied that I'd forsake my native land. Before I could protest, she put her mouth to mine, and sucked the broken English from my Gaelic tongue. She wound me in her briary arms of Eglantine. Two centuries have gone, yet she and I abide, like emblems of a rebel song no longer sung, or snowy blossoms drifting down the mountainside. Which leads into another poem. Um, I, Peter asked me to pick Another gallery poet, um, I picked a poem by Neil McCookian, uh, which pertains to 1798 as well, from the collection Shell Malir. Um, of Maeve's work, Kieran once commented that people are always asking what Maeve's poems are about, which to him seemed to be a ridiculous question. Um, I remember myself and Kim would talk about poetry would often would say to define is to destroy the the poem. It is what it is. And uh but of Maeve he said that it's like asking what a Charlie Parker saxophone solo means. It, it's a silly question. The poem is dream in a train. And snow. The world shovels snow into a pond without an echo. The image of water made visible is a cry as warm as life. The house is a perfect body, surpassing, unwriting me, as the density of black repairs light even grows it. Some part of my pine-wooded mind, sleeping or dead, was a tightened-up light I was sheltering for years, which destroys something other than flowers, eluding by means of their own surface, the unchanging sea, around a swimmer whose sigh is a fold, imposed upon the waves, suggestive of an awakening. I'd like to finish with one last poem. Um, where does poetry come from? Uh, whenever I last heard Kieran reading, it was his versions of Rambo um, in English, along with Lemo Merkula, um, who's also gone ahead of us. Uh, two great poets, Kieran and Liam, and they read in Paris and with beautiful music by Sean Markley and we talked about where did poetry come from it comes from the zone and we often myself and Kieran were both kind of obsessed with Stalker by Tarkovsky um, where you go into a room um, and the art and the beauty and the music um, is in the room and Kieran often talked about the small back room um, this is about a creature he encounters in a small back room um, uh, a talking horse, um, the horse's mouth. I got that story from the puka who appeared to me last night. He stepped out from the wardrobe door, shimmering in his deteriorating mirror, shivering the fringes of his ectoplasmic beard. I saw my breath as visible to him as nebulae, with chalky sentences he'd drawn with a hook from deep within me. And he read me like a book. I tried to speak, but there was nothing I could say. I travelled through an hourglass of Saharan time to universes unexplored by Star Trek, where monsters jarred and jimbled in primordial slime. And here, he said, the worms devoured your eyes, and here, the vultures scrabbed your heart, the vampires lanced your neck. All this, 
quoth he, to teach you necessary fear. And uh, Kieran actually met the horse in question many, many years ago when he was showing her house in Stranglas near Queen's University. Um, he took some magic mushrooms one night, as you do. Um, nothing seemed to be happening, so he took some more magic mushrooms. Again, nothing seemed to be happening. Uh, he got fed up and went to bed. He fell asleep. Uh, then woke up in the wee small hours to discover that the door of his wardrobe in the bedroom was opening and out stepped uh, a man with a horse's head um, who proceeded to say, Carson, I'm a messenger from a higher authority. Uh, we've been watching you for a long, long time. Uh, he proceeded to have a chat with this man with a horse's head about just about life, death, God, meaning the universe, um, his problems with his girlfriend at the time. Uh, the man with the horse's head sorted him out totally. He fell back to sleep again. The next day, his um, housemates said, what on earth were you doing last night? You were talking to Sinner for three hours. So maybe well, that's what poetry is, talking to Sinner. Uh, where does poetry come from? The horse's mouth. The zone of talking horses. That's it. So thank you for asking me to do this. And... Uh, in memory of Kieran, who was my brother and I loved, and his poetry will endure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dermot Bulger, and like many, many people, I was blessed to be a friend of the late Michael Hartnett. To mark, celebrate, and honour the 50th birthday of the Gallery Press, and in honour of my friend who would have been celebrating his 80th birthday next year if he had lived, I would like to read three poems published by Gallery Press and beautiful editions of his work over the last four and a half decades. Uh, this arena magazine is where Michael published many of his very early poems and uh, his biographical note from this will serve, which is that uh, Michael Hartnett was born in Newcastle, West County Limerick in 1941, favourite film star Sophia Loren. Uh, this is the first Gallery book I bought. It was in 1975. Gallery was five years old, Michael was 34 but looked 21, and I was 16. Um, I bought it with my wages from a summer job in the wire and cable unit at a factory in Finglas. It was 70 pence softback and £1.80 in a limited hardback edition. Wages weren't great in wire and cable, so I went for the 70p softback, but the uh, shop assistant guaranteed it came with a 50 year guarantee, so if it falls apart in the next five years, I would be up to uh, Oldcastle County Mead very quickly. Some poems in the book moved me greatly, some perplexed me, and this particular poem has become a classic poem, not just for me, but for people who love poetry all over the world. It's called Debt of an Irish Woman. Ignorant in the sense she ate monotonous food and thought the world was flat, and pagan in the sense she knew the things that moved at night were neither cats nor dogs, but pukas and black-faced men. She nevertheless had fierce pride, but sentenced in the end to eat cold, diminishing porridge in a stone-cold kitchen. She clinched her brittle hands around a world she could not understand. I loved her from the day she died. She was a summer dance at a crossroads. She was a card game where a nose was broken. She was a thing that nobody sings. She was a house ransacked by soldiers. She was a language seldom spoken. She was a child's puss full of useless things. Galvey published many fine editions of Michael's work. This is his collected poems, which was planned in his lifetime, but uh, sadly was published uh, in 2001, two years after his death. And uh, this poem is called The Actor's Kiss. It's a poem for his father, uh, who turns up in some of Michael's poems. The Actor's Kiss. I kissed my father as he lay in bed in the ward. Nurses walked on souls of sleep, and old men argued with themselves all day. The seven decades locked inside his head congealed into a timeless leaking heap. The painter lost his sense of all but grey. That actor kiss fell down a shaft too deep to send back echoes that I would have prized. 21 was 41 was 84, all one in his kaleidoscopic eyes. He willed to me his bitterness and trust, 
his cold ability to close a door. Later, over a drink, I realised that was her last kiss, and alas, her first. And the third poem I will read in memory of Michael is Michael would uh, phone me, would phone, he would phone many people in the mornings, uh, and some months before he died, he phoned me and we had a chat as usual, and he would always say, have you heard my latest joke? And he always had a new joke, and he told me his joke, and his joke was brilliant as it always was. And then just as we were going, he said, and have you heard my latest poem? And he recited this poem to me on the telephone in this room of my house in Dunkandra. And he said, you know, Angela Liston was his partner who really kept him alive in those last years of his life and uh, difficult years of his life. And uh, he said, when Angela heard the first verse, the look on her eyes, I thought she was going to strangle me. But then I said, An Angela, Angela, there's three verses. And these are the three verses he recited to me over the telephone from the payphone in the hall of his flat. Angela Liston. The rules you make, the strictures you insist on, have made me a beggar before you, Angela Liston. I have been kicked about the place, been mocked and been pissed on, but I find my way home to you, Angela Liston, and my wrinkled, anxious forehead amazingly has been kissed on. And I have been blessed by you, Angela Liston. Michael was blessed to have such a fine publisher for uh, in the Gallery Press during his lifetime and after his lifetime. Congratulations to the Gallery Press and thank you for honouring my friend so well.